Father God, we thank you for the opportunity of prayer. Thank you, Lord, that we can come before you, Lord, though unworthy we are, that we can open our hearts before you, Lord, especially in a moment of Earth's history, Lord, that so much, Lord, is dependent on how our relationship is with you at this time. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will open to our hearts, Lord, the true condition of our soul, Lord, that we are naked and wretched and blind, Lord, and that we have need of all that you are, Lord. We pray, O oh Lord, that as we look into these things, Lord, that bring us to a realization that we are at a point in time where we can either become the foolish or the wise, Lord. Help us to understand what these moments of earth history means, Lord, and as we study these things, help us to bring our lives in conformity to the truth for this time. Mold and shape us, Lord, and break us at this time, that, Lord, we may be truly repented in this time of refreshing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, hopefully we'll get through this presentation and we will have the, the basics of the prophecy school uh, behind us. Um, not that I don't personally like studying the basics as well as all the other parts, but uh, we'll be able to get into some, looking at some different passages in Scripture after we get some of these points down. Uh, we're still, up, uh, still looking at the purification of God's church. We've looked a little bit at the things that we, inspiration have said, will take place before the Sunday Law. We've tried to define the Sunday Law um, twofold when we're forced to observe Sunday and persecuted for keeping Sabbath, this is the Sunday law that fulfills Revelation 13, 11. And uh, this is the point in time where God purifies his church. And at this point, we're going to consider some of the places um, in Scripture where the purification of God's church is identified. There are more. The, the time limits it's for looking from looking at the uh, several illustrations about the Sunday Law and Bible prophecy. There was a point yesterday where I shared a, about an artist that uh, you, you look at her artwork and you see the forest, you keep looking, you finally see the American Indians in that picture. Well, that's the same way from my understanding with Bible prophecy. Until we recognize that the Sunday Law is the focus of Bible prophecy, uh, we can read through scriptures and not even recognize that what's being dressed there are the issues connected with the Sunday Law, and many times the Sunday Law itself is specifically identified. So here's just a few of the samplings of uh, where we're going to look at these parables and illustrations in connection with the Sunday Law. Um, and th the, the parables of Christ that we can learn so much from. Um, it's amazing how, if you look at them closely, you find out there's usually a lesson about the Sunday Law in those parables. Um, so we'll look at some of those as well. But let's um, consider the seal and the mark, which takes place, as we've already looked at, at the Sunday Law. Um, we've read this quote already. Uh, this is the one where the italicized is in the Review and Herald. And for a long time, I was teaching that Sister White italicized those words. And that's incorrect, but this is still a very good quote because it's asking the question specifically, when does all this take place? If the light of truth has been presented to you revealing the Sabbath of the fourth commandment and showing that there's no foundation in the word of God for Sunday observance, and yet you still cling to the false Sabbath, refusing to keep holy the Sabbath which God calls my holy day, you receive the mark of the beast. Now, th this other board, which is sort of out of my view, but I don't need to see it, this other view just board beyond me, that's the Sunday Law, and in theory, if we were going to put together a chart, we would pull that Sunday Law over here and lay it down because we're going to look at the, the divisions that take place at the Sunday Law. And one of the divisions that inspiration identifies that takes place at the Sunday Law is the mark of the beast and the seal of God. There's a, the, in Adventism first, and then those outside of Adventism are going to be confronted with the Sunday Law and uh, those living during that time period are going to demonstrate what character that they have prepared prior to their own personal testing time 
either a character prepared for the mark of the beast or a character prepared for the seal of God. And at the Sunday law, which is a crisis, Sister White refers to the Sunday law as a crisis, at the Sunday law crisis, Sister White also teaches something very important. I know you're probably all familiar with this. She also teaches this lesson, lesson most often in connection with the parable of the ten virgins. She says, character is never developed in a crisis. It's demonstrated in a crisis. And the Sunday law is the point in time where we will just demonstrate whether we have prepared a character for Christ or for Antichrist. So, um, the gold and the dross is another familiar biblical theme. And uh, this isn't the only place where you can find references to the golden draw and the dross and uh, tie them into the crisis of the Sunday Law. Testimonies, Volume 4, page 89. I was pointed to the providence of God among His people and was shown that every trial made by the refining, purifying process upon professed Christians proves some to be dross. The fine gold does not always appear. In every religious crisis, some fall under temptation. The shaking of God blows away multitudes like dry leaves. Prosperity multiplies a mass of professors. <clears throat> Adversity purges them out of the church. As a class, their spirits are not steadfast with God. They go out from us because they are not of us. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, many are offended. At any religious crisis this takes place, but at the Sunday Law, the great religious crisis, definitely the gold and the dross are separated. The Ten Virgins, we've dealt a little bit with this. We will deal with this all the way through. The parable of the Ten Virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of the Advent, Adventist people. If we're to understand Adventism, then we need to understand Matthew chapter 25. And then, of course, the truth of this is broadened by the next statement, Review and Herald, August 9, 1890. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has special application to this time. And like the third angel's message, ha has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth till the close of time. Now, this is a, a prophecy school. When was the parable of the ten virgins fulfilled to the very letter? In the Millerite time period, 1840-1844. When's it fulfilled again? In the time period, let's say, of the 144,000? At the end of the world, during our time. Um, but it says the third angel's message is present truth and will continue to be present truth. When did the third angel's message become present truth? October 22nd, 1844, the door was opened to the most holy place, allowing God's people by faith to see into uh, the Ark of the Covenant and see the Sabbath commandment. But when does the third angel's message become present truth again, even though it's still present truth? When does it become present truth again? At the Sunday Law. So it gets repeated, and it has two, way, two different times that it, it becomes present truth in a different sort of way, and that's um, building up for future presentations. But it's um, at the Sunday Law crisis where the wise and foolish are separated. Let none follow the example of the foolish virgins and think that it would be safe to wait until the crisis comes before gaining a preparation of character to stand in that time. It will be too late to seek for the righteousness of Christ when the guests are ex called in and examined. Now is the time to put on the righteousness of Christ, the wedding garment that will fit you to enter into the marriage supper of the Lamb. In the parable, the foolish virgins are represented as begging for oil and failing to receive it at their request. This is symbolic of those who have not prepared themselves by developing a character to stand in a time of crisis. It is as if they should go to their neighbors and say, Give me your character or I shall be lost. Those that were wise could not impart their oil to the flickering lamps of the foolish virgins. Character is not transferable. It is not to be bought or sold. It is to be acquired. The Lord has given to every individual an opportunity to obtain a righteous character through the hours of probation. Please notice that she's putting this story of the parable of ten virgins in the, into the context of the close of probation. 
The Lord has given to every individual an opportunity to obtain a righteous character through the hours of probation, but he has not provided a way by which one human agent may impart to another the character which he has developed by going through hard experiences, by learning lessons from great, the great teacher so that he, he can manifest patience under trial and exercise faith so that he can remove mountains of impossibility. It is impossible to impart the fragrance of love, to give to another gentleness, tact, and perseverance. It is impossible for one human heart to pour into another the love of God and humanity. But the day is coming, and it is close upon us, when every phase of character will be revealed by special temptation. Those who remain true to principle, who exercise faith to the end, will be those who have proved true under test and trial during the previous hours of their probation and have formed characters after the likeness of Christ. It will be those who have cultivated close acquaintance with Christ who, through his wisdom and grace, are partakers of the divine nature. But no human being can give to another heart devotion and noble qualities of mind and supply his deficiencies with moral power. We can each do much for each other by giving to men a Christ-like example, thus influencing them to go to Christ for the righteousness without which they cannot stand in the judgment. Men should prayerfully consider the important matter of character building and frame their characters after the divine model. It's at the Sunday law that the wise and foolish virgins of Adventism are separated, and, and it's at the Sunday law, you know, I've been listening to Russell, and I'm sure that we're all familiar with this. I understand what he's saying, but I haven't heard him uh, point out uh, that Sister White is clear that the parable of the ten virgins is the parable for Adventism, but it also applies to the world outside. It has a dual application. When he's talking about uh, the virgins carrying the doctrines of Rome, um, you, can, you can apply that correctly within Adventism, but the whole, all the Protestant churches in the, the 1844 time period were being tested whether they were Millerites or not, and they were all experiencing the parable of the ten virgins. And it's it's the same with the Laodicean message. Sister White specifically says the Laodicean message is for Seventh-day Adventists, and she specifically says the Laodicean message is for the world. They, they, there's dual application there. So um, this is one of them that we were referring to about character being manifested in a crisis. Character is revealed by a crisis. When the earnest voice proclaimed at midnight, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. The sleeping virgins roused from their slumbers, and it was seen who had made preparation for the event. Both parties were taken unawares, but one was prepared for the emergency, and the other was found without preparation. Character is revealed by circumstances. Emergencies bring out the true metal of character, some sudden and unlooked for calamity, bereavement or crisis, some unexpected sickness or anguish. Something that brings the soul face to face with death will bring out the true inwardness of character. It will be made manifest whether or not there is any real faith in the promises of the word of God. It will be made manifest whether or not the soul is sustained by grace, whether there is oil in the vessel with the lamp. Testing time comes to all. How do we conduct ourselves under test? under the test and proving of God. Do our lamps go out, or do we still keep them burning? Are we prepared for an, every emergency by our connection with Him who is full of grace and truth? The five wise virgins could not impart their character to the five foolish virgins. Character must be formed by us as individuals. The crisis where character is demonstrated at the end of time is the Sunday Law crisis. It's the Point in the parable of the den, ten virgins where the door is closed. That oil is the righteousness of Christ. It represents character, and character is not transferable. No man can secure it for another. Each must obtain for himself a character purified from every stain of sin. As we get further in, where we start looking at the books of Daniel and Revelation, there's a quote that I used to try to point out a truth that we probably all understand. But when referring to the dragon in Revelation 12 and great controversy, Sister White says, the dragon in Revelation 12 is Satan, but in a secondary sense, it is pagan Rome, um, which is you have to deal with when you're gonna deal with Revelation 12. But a secondary truth there, there is, is that when it comes to Bible prophecies, there's primary, secondary, and tertiary, and even beyond meanings to symbols. And uh, I just, I hope I said tertiary right. I just learned that word. There's more than one uh, 
application of the symbols. And usually when you ask Seventh-day Adventists, what does the oil mean, symbolize in the parable of the ten virgins, everyone says the Holy Spirit. And it does, it does. But it also can be understood to represent character. And what else can it be re represent? The righteousness of Christ, what else can it represent? Experience. But we, we read one already in this prophecy school. That's the answer I'm looking for. The communications from God represents the community, which is the Holy Spirit. But uh, the reason, one of the reasons that I like to emphasize character is when we read the parable of the ten virgins of Seventh-day Adventists and we start applying it to the Sunday law time period and the fact that there's going to be a separation and the fact that the probation's about to close. Most of us Seventh-day Adventists, we don't want to hear that. So when we're asked, what's the oil represent? We say the Holy Spirit, because that's spiritual and that's good. But it really, it's not quite like saying character. Because once you start saying that character is part of the, this story, then it starts getting real personal. Because we realize that we have to have the character that will demonstrate the character of Christ when this crisis hits. The state of the church represented by the foolish virgins is also spoken of as the Laodicean state. And, and she says this more than once. So when we're lining up the Sunday law here and saying that one of the separations that's illustrated in inspiration is, it, is, it, is that it is at this point that the wise and foolish virgins are separated, this allows us to say that it's at this point that the foolish virgins, the Laodiceans, are separated from who? The Philadelphians. The Philadelphians. They're right there in the same um, time period. Uh, we don't have time to go into that, but what did all the virgins do? They slept. And what am I saying here? I'm saying that the experience of Laodicean symbolizes who? The foolish virgins. The experience of Laodicea symbolizes the foolish virgins. So what's the experience of the Philadelphians symbolize? The wise virgins. But all the virgins slept, right? What's the sleeping church? Sardis. Sardis, the ones that introduces Philadelphia and Laodicea, is the, the wake-up church. Those three churches uh, can, be, can correspond to the parable of ten virgins. We don't have time to go there, but we did. Christ Object Lessons, page 71. The tares and the wheat are to grow together until the harvest, and the harvest is at the end of probationary time. I don't know if I said this on the tape. I've said it to a few people. As I was putting this material together, there was one dear brother of mine who may be hearing this, and uh, I'm not going to name a name, but I was trying to drive a point home that inspiration teaches that this crisis it identifies it as the close of probation. It's the close of probation over and over again. That, that's, that's what inspiration says. And sometimes this brother isn't the only one. If he was the only one, I wouldn't worry about it. But many of us begin to see these truths about the Sunday law. And we just have a hesitancy to say, at the Sunday law, probation closes. Because that, when you tell Seventh-day Adventists that, that's, that's one thing that we we tend to recoil against. You're not only giving me a, a, an important piece of information, you're telling me time is up, and are you really sure that part of it's true? So as I was going through and putting these notes together for this school, that's why some of these things are highlighted. Brothers and sisters, the wheat and tares are separated at the end of probationary time. And the wheat and tares, where are they? They're in the church. And when is the church purified? At the Sunday law. <laughs> So the Sunday law is the end of probation for Seventh-day Adventists. And that's where the wheat and tares are separated. Manuscript releases, volume 16, page 271. The parable of the ten virgins was given by Christ himself, and every specification should be carefully studied. A time will come when the door will be shut. What does it mean that a door shuts in Bible prophecy? The close of probation. It's the very bottom line of the parable of the ten virgins. And it's the one Sister White says, study all the specifications in that parable, but a time will come when the door will be shut. There's the bottom line of it. 
We are represented either by the wise or the foolish virgins. We cannot now distinguish, nor have we authority to say who are the wise and who are foolish. There are those who hold the truth in unrighteousness, and these appear outwardly like the wise. A sister was sharing with me this morning before this meeting that she's seen a, um, a book recently that, that lists all the different plants that are identified in the Bible. And it, she was just amazed that here was the picture of tares, the tares, the biblical tares and the biblical wheat, and they're identical except for one thing. The wheat has fruit, and the tares don't. But besides that, you can't tell the difference. But it, the, the, that's actually how they are. And that's the same thing with the virgins, the, the virgins, the tares, the gold and the dross, it's the same story and the separation of those different inspired symbols all takes place at the same historical event. And what event is that? The Sunday law is the tool that the Lord uses to purify his church. And this is an important truth. Do you, do you, we all know how many people since, since what was it, eight was it 1890s? I think it was the 1890s. I could be wrong on that. But I think it was in the 1890s when Stanton started teaching that the Seventh-day Adventist Church was Babylon and that the loud cry message was to come out of her. Anybody correct me on that date? Okay, I, 1896 pops into my mind, but I think it's 1890s. So for over 100 years, we've had brethren lose their way about on, just on that subject alone. And if they realize that, yes, there is going to be Things going wrong within God's church, but that God will purify his church in his own way, his own time, and in fact, he's even identified how he purifies it through the Sunday law, they wouldn't have stumbled and lost their way. This is an important truth. If, if only for that. It's important for things beyond that. But. Yeah, it was, it, there was, it was, the Sunday light crisis was, was growing during that time. Review and Herald, June, Jan January 13th, 1885, the sheep and the goats. There are two parties in the world, the advocates, advocates of truth and purity, as well as the advocates of error and corruption. Uh, you know, I don't know about, I, I'm, you. there's no way probably that he's doing it for you, but Brother Russell's been putting some stumbling blocks before me. Because I'm listening to what he's saying and I'm thinking, boy, I would like to, I would like to get involved with, with what he's saying because he's turned on lights all over the place in my mind that are just, I would love to spend the time sharing some of those lights, but I have to stay on track to get through this material. But this is part, is part of what he's saying right here. There are two parties in the world. There was two parties prior to 1844, the advocates of truth and purity as well as the advocates of error and corruption. And the earnest inquiry of each, each should be, what is truth? At the last, we must all stand in one party or the other. And in which company do we wish to be found when Jesus, Jesus so, shall come in the clouds of heaven? Brothers and sisters, in Adventism, when was the first time that Jesus came in the clouds of heaven? In Adventism history. 1844, that's what Brother Russell was saying. And he's right, he's spot on. Jesus came in clouds into the most holy place. When's the second time Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven? The second coming. There, there, it's, it's just, it's right there. It's right there. And, and during this time period, it's about dividing these two groups of people back then and now. And these two groups of people are in the church and outside of the church. And those of us that are holding on to error, where does the error come from? Babylon. Babylon. We're carrying Babylon. We're carrying the woman. And when Christ shall separate the righteous from the wicked, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats, he shall sh set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. We shall all want to be on the right hand. We shall not then esteem it an honor to be found with the multitudes in the paths of transgression. Judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel? The wedding garment. The days of our probation. 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 The days of our probation are fast closing. 
The end is near. To us the warning is given. Take heed to yourself, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares and cares of this life, and so that the day come upon you unawares. Beware lest it find you unready. Take heed lest you be found at the king's feast without a wedding garment. I, they're all the same message. They're being expressed in a variety of ways so that the Holy Spirit's given us every possibility to come to understand the truths connected with this purification that takes place at the Sunday Law Crisis. In such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh, blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. All of this separation, I, I will, in, the, in this little blackboard, little whiteboard in the center, what we're trying to express is that all of these different illustrations of judgment and separation in the Bible align with the Sunday Law. Now, um, in the study that we do, which is nine parts on the purification of God's church, we spend one presentation just on Ezekiel 8 through 10, and you could, you could put it at Ezekiel 8 through 12. It's the same vision. Um, and so when you find the quotes that Sister White has, like this first quote, study the ninth chapter of Ezekiel, these words will be literally fulfilled. One of the first things uh, I think that we need to acknowledge is that Ezekiel chapter 9 doesn't begin in verse 1. The vision of Ezekiel chapter 9 begins back in chapter 8, and it goes on beyond chapter 9. Sister White's pointing to, to chapter 9 here, but how can we understand cha chapter 9 uh, perfectly if we don't understand the context and what it's set? So all I'm saying is this is a complete vision, and in this vision you have uh, the prophetic rule of repeat and enlarge. It's identifying how God's church is purified, and chapter 8 is identifying... What happens to the tares? What happens to the foolish virgins? What happens to those that don't have the wedding garment? And what happens to them in chapter 8? They come to a conclusion in chapter 8, bowing down to the sun. Now what would that symbolize in Bible prophecy? The Sunday law. And then in chapter 9, we have a group of people that are sighing and crying for the abominations done in the land, in Jerusalem. And those are the people that are sealed. What's the story of this vision? It's who's sealed, who gets the mark of the beast at the time of the Sunday law. But the bottom line of this, of this vision is in uh, chapter 10, I think, verse 2 or 3, where an angel is told to go and take uh, some coals from the altar and throw them into Jerusalem, which in Testimonies, volume 5, referring to this vision, Sister White says, it's the Seventh-day Adventist church. And she says that the coals symbolized purification. This vision of Ezekiel is a vision about how God purifies his church. And how does he do it? He does it with the Sunday law. There's those men bowing down to the sun in chapter 8. Uh, and we've, we're familiar with that. You see the quote, verses 16 through 18. Testimonies, volume 5, page 211. Here we see that the church, the Lord's sanctuary, was the first to feel the stroke of the wrath of God, the ancient men, those who God had given great light and who had stood as guardians of the spiritual interests of the people, had betrayed their trust. Now, does that disagree with what uh, the story of Nehemiah says or the story of Numbers 22? Nope. It's right in agreement. There's going to be problems in God's church. And when does God resolve the problems? At the Sunday law. The Sunday law is the Focus of Bible prophecy. 1888 materials, 1303. We are amid the perils of the last days. The time will come when the prophecy of Ezekiel 9 will be fulfilled. That prophecy should be carefully studied, for it will be fulfilled to the very letter. Study also the 10th chapter, which represents the hand of God at work to bring perfect method and harmonious working into all the operations of his prepared instrumentalities. The 11th and 12th chapters also should receive critical, thoughtful attention. Let these prophecies be studied on your knees before God unless you take the stumbling blocks which by your own perverse spirit you have laid in the way of many who have been connected with you. God will turn his face utterly from you and your associates. I submit to you that if a correct study of these chapters she's speaking about 
identifies clearly that the Sunday law is the tool the Lord uses to purify his church. And that's one of the most important themes in this vision that she says we need to study intently. Ezekiel 10.2 And he spake unto the man clothed with linen and said, Go in between the wheels, even under the cherub, and fill thine hand with coals of fire from between the cherubims and scatter them over the city. And he went in in my sight. The live coal is symbolic of purification. Review and Herald, October 16, 1888. God's going to purify his church through the Sunday Law Crisis. And you'll notice in that, that previous quote, let's see if I can go back there. In the middle there, it says, Study also the tenth chapter which represents the hand of God as at work to bring perfect method and harmonious working into all his operations. This is talking about what takes place here. After the Sunday law, when the church is purified, this is when Sister White says, The Lord takes the work into his own hands. And the logic of information about the Sunday Law is that the corporate structure, and don't misunderstand me, I'm not trying to attack the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the corporate structure does not go beyond the Sunday Law. It doesn't matter if every man in the corporate structure is an Enoch, or if every man in the corporate structure is a Judas. It's not about, I'm not talking about the people in the corporate structure. I'm talking about the, the, fa the re reality of what takes place at the Sunday Law. The Sunday law is when you're forced to observe Sunday and persecuted for keeping Sabbath. If every man that's holding a position in the corporate structure is faithful at the Sunday law crisis, what are they going to do? They're going to uphold Sabbath, and the laws of the land are going to shut that corporation down. Every earthly support will be cut off. Will be cut off. That's if they're all faithful. Now, if they were all unfaithful, and I'm not saying they are, and I don't believe that they are, so don't read that into that, whoever may be listening on this tape. They won't have the spiritual strength to stand, because who is the first to be totally void of the Holy Spirit during this time period? We've already read it. What group of people are the first to be left? Those people who have had great light and opportunities. We read a quote earlier. They don't have the spiritual strength to stand, so I don't know exactly what they would do, but perhaps they would keep the corporation and change it to the First Day Adventist Church. I, I, I kind of doubt that. But in any case, all I'm saying is the corporate structure doesn't go beyond the Sunday Law. It's here where the Lord takes the work into His own hands, just like Pentecost, just like the midnight cry swept over this land in 1843, 1844, 1844. This is where the Lord brings perfect method and harmonious working when he purifies his church at the Sunday Law. Daniel chapter 3. There is at least 11 different places in the writings of Ellen White where Sister White says that the image on the plain of Dura that Nebuchadnezzar set up in chapter 3 is the Sunday Law. There's at least 11. There may be more. Trial and persecution will come to all who, in obedience to the word of God, refuse to worship this false Sabbath. Force is the last resort of every false religion. At first it tries attraction, as the king of Babylon tried the power of music and outward show. If these attractions, invented by men inspired by Satan, failed to make men worship the image, the hungry flames of the furnace were ready to consume them. So it will be now. When the law of God, notice, notice the uh, whens and the thens in this one. When the law of God is being made void, when his name is dishonored, when it is considered disloyal to the laws of the land to keep the seventh day as the Sabbath, when wolves in sheep's clothing through blindness of mind and hardness of heart are seeking to compel the conscience, shall we give up our loyalty to God? No, no. The wrongdoer is filled with a satanic hatred against those who are loyal to the commandments of God, but the value of God's law as the rule of conduct must be made manifest. Amen. What happens in a crisis? Character is manifested in a crisis. The zeal of those who obey the Lord will be increased as 
And I threw that one in there. As the world and the church unite in making void the law, they will say with the psalmist, I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. This is what will be sure to occur when the law of God is made void by national act. When Sunday is exalted and sustained by law, then, then, the principle that actuates the people of God will be made manifest as the principle of the three Hebrews was made manifest when Nebuchadnezzar commanded them to worship the golden image in the plain of Dura. We can see what our duty is when truth is overborne by falsehood. There's eight winds in there, all giving us information about the conditions of the Sunday law and then what takes place. That's where we manifest the character that we prepared prior to that Sunday law test. It's the focus of end time Bible prophecy. History will be repeated, false religion will be exalted. The first day of the week, a common working day possessing no sanctity whatever will be set up as was the image at Babylon. Brothers and sisters, have you ever asked yourself, I know you have probably, why wasn't Daniel there? Don't answer that. I have the answer. He would have thrown off the, the symbolism of that history. Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego represent the three angels' messages that come to the Sunday law, the, the image on the plain of Dura. And at that point, the crisis hits, and that crisis is symbolizing what? What's it symbolizing? The latter rain, loud cry, fourth angel's message, and as soon as they're in the fiery furnace, who comes down out of heaven and stands with them? The angel of Revelation 18. Christ. That's why Daniel wasn't there. It would have then been the 4-1, uh, and it didn't fit. I don't know where Daniel was, but it fits. They yeah, they knew he wouldn't have bowed. Maybe they were unsure about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, huh? It could be, it could be. Uh, General Conference Daily Bulletin 178, 179. There are thousands upon thousands who bear aloft the standard of the world's Sabbath, exalting the image of the papacy created by the man of sin. The church worship the image of the beast and receive his mark, even as the inhabitants of Babylon worship the golden image which Nebuchadnezzar set up in the plain of Dura. Daniel chapter 3 is the Sunday law test. Isaiah 8. Isaiah 8.10. It's Isaiah 10.1. Yes, I, I, and, I, and I have that underneath uh, the next quote. Anyway, the, the references on these two quotes are off. This, this is Isaiah 10.1. Woe unto them to decree unrighteous decrees and that right grievousness which they have prescribed. There's, there's a, two, maybe three. It's left me now, but there's at least two places where Sister White says this unrighteous decree of Isaiah 10, 1 is the Sunday law. It's the Sunday law. And if you follow on in this vision of Isaiah, and we're going to deal with this vision of Isaiah, this vision of Isaiah has a direct and important connection with, to Daniel eleven forty to 45. Right now, all we're doing is identifying that the starting point for this sequence of events in Isaiah 10 is the Sunday law. This unrighteous decree is the Sunday law. Um, and now, here's a quote. That where, where Sister White identifies this as the Sunday law. Remember now, Sister White's already told us that the Daniel chapter 3 is the Sunday law test. So here we go. As the idol Sabbath has been set up, as the golden image was set up in the plain of Dura, and as Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, issued a decree that all who would not bow down and worship this image should be killed, so a proclamation will be made that all who will not receive the Sunday institution will be punished with imprisonment and death. Thus the Sabbath of the, Lord, of the Lord is trampled underfoot. But the Lord has declared, I notice she's tying now Isaiah 10.1 into Daniel 3 and into the Sunday law. The Lord has declared, woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees and right grievousness which they have prescribed. The great day of the Lord is near. 
It is near and hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them out of the, day's Lord, the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole and shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance, riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Now notice this. Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired, before the decree. What's she, who's she referring to now? She's just went, not my point. She's, she's just said Daniel chapter 3 is the Sunday law. She said Isaiah 10.1 is the Sunday law. And now she's moved, moved into Zephaniah. Zephaniah talks about a decree also, and he says, we're together together before the decree. And she's quoting him. She's saying, before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, seek ye the Lord, all you meek of the earth, which have brought his judgments, seek righteousness. Does, is this consistent with what we've been saying about having a character prepared before the Sunday law? We're to gather together before the decree and do what? Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Zephaniah's decree, Zephaniah 2, verses 2 through 4. Gather yourselves together. This is the Sunday law decree. Sister White just applied it in that fashion. Gather yourself together, yea, gather together, O nation not desire, before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff. Before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, seek ye the Lord, all you meek of the earth, which, is, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. The Sunday law is the focus of end time Bible prophecy. And the more we recognize that, the more we will see it in the passages in the Bible and once we see it in a passage, I mean, once you, once you go into Isaiah chapter 10 and you, you know, okay, I have the testimony of, of two. Actually, you, in just in the, the quote from Sister White, you actually, I think, correctly can say you have the testimony of four. You have Sister White saying, here's the Sunday law. That's Sister White. And she's saying Isaiah 10.1 is the Sunday law. That's Isaiah. And then she, she pointed us to Daniel chapter 3. That's Daniel. And then she took us to Zephaniah. There's four witnesses that this is the Sunday law. And once, once you begin, once you know that, and you bring those passages, Daniel, Zephaniah, Isaiah, down to the end of the world, where do you place them? Do you place them when Michael stands up? Do you place them... Uh, you don't. You place them on the Sunday law. And when you do, that's when the light begins to, to increase, increase. You have to bring them down to the end of the world and place them in the right place. And the, one of the primary keys in Bible prophecy is the Sunday law. It's the focus. It's what allows us to bring them to the end of the world and correctly align them together. The haughty Assyrian in Isaiah chapter 10. The theme of Isaiah chapter 10, which begins in verse 1. Um, with the unrighteous decree, you, you read Isaiah 10 through 14, and you'll see that the focus is the haughty Assyrian. And who do you, who what, each of the ancient prophets spoke more for our day than the days in which they lived. If Isaiah 10 1 is the Sunday law, and the, the evil, powerful individual in the passage is the Assyrian, what is Assyrian symbolizing there? Babylon, Rome, the papacy. The, the haughty Assyrian is the papacy in, in the terminology of Isaiah. And it tells, in, in, you can see the, the verses here, it tells, I selected it out to show you the haughty Assyrian. Let's read them. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and upon Jerusalem. What's the Lord's work at the end of time, brothers and sisters, that he performs on Jerusalem? He perfects his character in a group of people. That's his whole work. When it comes to pass, when that happens, I will punish 
the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. What punishment is this talking about? Is this where the king of the north comes to his end and none shall help? It certainly is. This is the final and complete fall of Babylon. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, I, O my people that dwell, dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. For yet a little while and the indignation shall cease in mine anger and their destruction. And the Lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. And as his rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt. He t tells how the papacy is destroyed here, or brought to its end, and he comes to his end at the Rock of Oreb. There's only three places in Scripture where the Rock of Oreb is identified. One is here, where the papacy comes to its end, the Rock of Oreb. The other one is in Judges, the starting point is in Judges 7.25. This is in the story of Gideon. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb, and pursued Midian, and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. These two princes in the story of Gideon, their names, you go through and you look at the names in the story of Gideon, of the different characters that are there, and you'll find that these are the only ones that have animal names, and Oreb means a raven. What's a raven? Do you have ra ravens in Europe? Big black scavenger? Okay, so let's put it in biblical terms. What are they? They're an unclean bird. Oreb's the unclean bird of Bible prophecy. He's the haughty Assyrian that comes to his end at the rock of Oreb. But he also comes to his end with Zeb. And Zeb means jackal or wolf. Uh, you do have wolves in Germany, right? Wolves. Wolves in Germany. Um, what's the characteristic of wolves? They hunt in a pack. They're a confederacy. And they come to their end together. And in Psalm 83 is the third place that you find this destruction emphasized. And uh, this is leading into Daniel chapter 2 and Revelation 17. Psalm 83 they have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. There is a confederacy, according to Psalms 83, at the end of the world that is attempting to destroy modern Israel. And they've come together with one consent. What's one consent? Well, it's sort of like, one mind of the ten kings of Revelation 17. I mean, it's almost identical. And you know why it is identical? Because it tells us who the confederacy are, and we can count them. The tabernacles of Edom, one. And the Ishmaelites, two. And Moab, three. And the Hagarenes, four. Gebel, five. And Ammon, six. And Amalek, Seven, the Philistines, eight, with the inhabitants of Tyre, nine, Asher, ten, also is joined with them. They have hope in the children of Lot. Don't count Lot. Lot is a, a general word for the enemies of God, and he's already represented in Ammon and Moab. There's ten enemies in this confederacy that are attempting to oppose and destroy God and his people at the end of the world. Is that what the ten kings of Revelation 17 do? Brothers and sisters, what's one of our first rules? Upon the testimony of two or three, a thing is established. In Revelation 17, we have ten kings that one of their primary characteristics is that they're of one mind and they're seeking to destroy God's people at the end of the world. And in Psalm 83, we have ten kings one more time with the identical purpose. Each of the ancient prophets were speaking about the end of the world. Upon the testimony of two or three things shall be established. But notice, it talks about their destruction. It says, do unto them as unto the Midianites, as to Sisera, as to Jabin, at the brook of Kisan, which perished at Ender, they became as dung for the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb. In the story of Gideon, you have two princes that die together. Their heads are both brought to Gideon. One of them, his name means an unclean bird. The other one is an animal that hunts in a pack. One of them is the papacy. 
One of them is the evil confederacy at the end of time, the ten horns. And we know it's ten because it's ten here. They die together. They come to their end together. Is that what Bible prophecy teaches? Do all the kingdoms of the world come to an end at the same time that the rock strikes the feet of the image of Daniel 2? How many toes on the feet of that image? Ten. Another illustration of the purification of God's church is the church militant and the church tri triumphant. Has no, God no living church? He has a church, but is the, it is the church militant, not the church triumphant. We are sorry that there are defective members, that, are, that there are tares amid the wheat. Brothers and sisters, here's a theme of church militant, church triumphant. And Sister White just tied it together with the wheat and tares. So the information that's available about the wheat and tares, we can place within the information of the, the church militant and the, and the church triumphant. We could stop there. It, we, we now know, we already identified who the wheat and the tares are. They're the ones that get separated in the crisis time of the Sunday law. So the church militant, church triumphant, they have to fit into that scenario. So who are they? The church militant is the church with wheat and tares. The church triumphant is when the tares are gone. But I'll read on. We are sorry that there are defective members, that there are tares amid the wheat. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man who which soweth good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou sow good seed in the, thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather you together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. The church triumphant uh, comes into existence at the Sunday law, which is consistent with everything else that we've been dealing with. There's the, the breakdown of what we've just went through. Now, we'll keep moving forward. We're off. We're moving from the point about the division, the, the tool of separation, the tool of purification of the Sunday law. We're going to start moving beyond this time. And these are fairly cut and dry. Men cannot without impunity reject the warning which God in his mercy sends them. A message was sent from heaven to the world in Noah day. Notice how in this passage, Sister White is going to be taking sacred histories and bringing them down to our time, it's, it's the history of the Bible that illustrates the end of the world. A message was sent from heaven to the world in Noah's day, and their salvation depended upon the manner in which they treated that message. Because they rejected the warning, the Spirit of God was withdrawn from the sinful race, and they perished in the waters of the flood. In the time of Abraham, mercy ceased to plead with the guilty inhabitants of Sodom, and all but Lot and his wife and two daughters were consumed by the fire sent down from heaven. So in the days of Christ, the Son of God declared, un declared to the unbelieving Jews of that generation, your house is left unto you desolate. Looking down to the last days, the same infinite power declares concerning those who receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. As they reject the teachings of his word, God withdraws his spirit and leads them to the deceptions which they love. Brothers and sisters, this was fulfilled in the 1840 to 1844 time period. That's what was going on. This history, and it's fulfilled again. There's a separation process. As a power is coming down from heather, heaven in the Millerite time period, the power of Revelation 10. In our day and age, it's the power of Revelation 18. There's places where S Sister White says, at this time, there's a power coming up from beneath. The satanic power as men are separated between truth and error. If, if this is the present truth message we're dealing with here, and it is, it means that if we choose to reject this message, what we're going to be receiving is strong delusion. That's how serious this is. People that hear this message and, and don't even consider it, just you know, disregard it and walk away from it, they don't even know what they're dealing with. 
They, they have the responsibility as Christians to test it first before they walk away. What a tragedy. They don't even realize the darkness that they may be going into if this is present truth. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 363. The time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel's angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-parting Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. For it is the work of everyone to whom the message of warning has come to lift up Jesus, to pre present him to the world as revealed in types, as shadowed in symbols, as manifested in the revelation of the prophets, as unveiled in the lessons given to his disciples, and in the wonderful miracles wrought for the sons of men. Search ye the scriptures, for they are they that testify of me. Brothers and sisters, many people take this quote, and they are right. They're right. The message of Christ's righteousness is the loud cry message. That's what it is. That's what it is. But if we receive this message, what do we do? Well, we take a message of warning. And the message of warning is defined as being set forth with types and symbols and the revelations of the prophets. It's the prophetic message that is the loud cry message that brings the experience of the righteousness of Christ because it brings the truth that probation is about to close. And if I don't have a character prepared to be a wise virgin, to be gold, to be wheat, I'm going to be lost. If that truth isn't enough to awaken me from my Laodicean condition, nothing is. That's, that's designed by God to awaken me to the fact that it's time to quit playing around with sin or you're lost. That's what the Holy Spirit says with the prophetic message. If I choose to receive that message and bring my life into agreement with that truth, then the Lord clothes me with the righteousness that is only His. And that is the final warning message that goes to the world. People look at us and they don't see us any longer. They see Christ. Loud cry message during this time period, after the church is purified, church triumphant. The last great conflict is before us, but help is to come to all who love God and obey his law. And the earth, the whole earth, is to be lighted with the glory of God. This is a wonderful manifestation of the power of God, just like the 1840 time period. Another angel is to come down from heaven. This is the angel representing the giving of the loud cry. Back then it was not the loud cry, what was it? The midnight cry which is to come from those who are preparing to cry mightily with a strong voice. Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen, is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit, a cage of every unclean and hateful raven bird. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that it is your intention to purify your people. And we see by the events taking place in agreement with your word that uh, this process is underway. We ask that you do what it takes to allow us to be among those that stand faithful during this testing time. And we lift up before you our friends and our families and our neighbors around us, those that we're responsible for sharing this message with, and ask that you give us opportunity to be used by you to awaken them to their need of your presence and their experience. Uh, we thank you for this school so far. We ask you to continue to be with us uh, throughout the school and this day. And we ask for your continued presence of your spirit and your angels. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>